All right, hi everybody, welcome back. Attorney Steve Vondren here. We've got some more breaking news for you here in the torrent trenches, okay? So um, if you've been following my videos on BitTorrent litigation, that's one of the things we do, illegal file sharing on the internet, basically downloading movies and sharing them with the swarm. We've tried to warn people, don't do this. We've tried to warn you that if you're doing it with a movie company, you could end up in a lawsuit. You could end up paying thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, a lot of people, I think, have listened, but a lot of people apparently haven't. So um, here we have a case, and what happens in these cases, as I've mentioned, is the plaintiff. This is Strike 3 Holdings. You can see them right here. They are a producer of adult pornography films. They will file lawsuits. They have filed hundreds and thousands, hundreds and even thousands of lawsuits is what I'm trying to say. And what happens is they try to get your name and your address, and they try to figure out if, if you're the infringer, and if so, to try to seek a settlement for copyright infringement. Okay, so this is internet copyright infringement, folks. Um, but here was a big case that came out. Um, oftentimes, parties will file a defendant will file a motion to quash. These parties will be seeking a subpoena when they get into a case. And here's a good example here. Let me see if I can blow this up for you. So here's the case. You can see it, um, 320CV00209. And um, this is the judge, Judge Cynthia Bashant, and the uh, referral to the magistrate judge, Jill Burkhart. So this case involves a um, again a uh, complaint over copyright infringement and plaintiff doing what it usually does seeking early discovery here, here we can see that we have a motion for early discovery that's typically what you're going to see in these things so here i'm going and to take a just a quick peek at it you'll see because usually the parties in federal court have to wait until there's a meet and confer meeting or what we call rule 26 before they move forward with seeking um, discovery. For example, here they want to seek a subpoena, third-party subpoena. They want to serve it on the internet service provider. Maybe it's Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, whatnot. So they want to serve a subpoena, an early subpoena. Okay, and so they'll submit these motions. The courts in many cases have granted these motions. Um, but this is a case where the court was not willing to grant the motion for early discovery. And I want to give you a quick look at the order. It's a it's a short one. Now it says five pages, but you can see the last page is the conclusion. Lots of times, actually, I like to start with the conclusion. For the reasons stated above, the court denies the plaintiff strike three ex party motion. The, not, the denial is without prejudice to the plaintiff, so it can refile, um, so forth and so on. But that was the order of the judge. Now let's go find out what the judge said here. Okay, this is very important. Um, um, again, this is an order denying before the court is the ex party motion for leave to serve a third party subpoena prior to a Rule 26 conference. No opposition was filed. Many times the defendants have no idea that anything's even going on. And usually they're named here, as you can see, as a John Doe. So usually people have no idea what's going on. Or maybe it's an IP address. But no opposition was filed as no defendant has been named or served in the case. For the reasons set forth below, plaintiff's ex parte motion is denied without prejudice. Let's take a, just a quick look at the background here. This is one of the numerous cases filed by plaintiff alleging copyright infringement and claims against a John Doe defendant using a BitTorrent file sharing system. There's some footnotes down here about an additional case. Uh, additional cases that were filed. Plaintiff alleges that it is the owner. I'll let you look at this. Black Tushy, Black Raw, and Vixen are the, the movies. Um, they filed this action, as you can see, against the John Doe. I'm trying to keep this short for you, so pause it if you want to read it. And because defendant used the internet to commit the alleged infringement, plaintiff alleges that it knows only by his or her IP address, which was designed, assigned by to the defendant by the internet service provider. Now, these uh, IP addresses are dynamic. They will change frequently depending on the ISP. So a lot of times they're picking a date saying, you know, this is the date on which I think there's infringement. We're serving a subpoena, so forth and so on. So that can be very important as well. I'm going to talk about that more in another video. Um, at any rate, they were seeking the subpoena, the early subpoena. Here's the legal standard, okay? Now, so a lot of you probably, a lot of you law school students are probably like, what the heck is early discoveries, early subpoenas? 
they're looking to get the name and address early. Usually you have to wait till this Rule 26F conference to do it or otherwise authorized by the court. So they're seeking this early discovery. They want to get to it. They want to get down to business. Um, FRCP 26D is in dog one. However, in rare cases, courts have made exceptions permitting limited discovery to ensue after filing of the complaint to permit the plaintiff to learn the identifying facts necessary to permit service on the defendant. So here's one thing I pick up on is have made exceptions in rare cases. Do you see that? Okay, so in these litigation, these bit torn cases, lately it's been more the rule than the exception. So it's, um, but this is what it says. This is the legal standard as it says, okay? Um, going down, let's just take it down. If you want to pause that and see some of these other cases, feel free to look at that, okay? And again, every court's different. This is the Southern District of California. Um, here's a case cited from the Northern District in the Bay Area. So courts can differ. Requ requests to conduct discovery pr prior to a Rule 26F conference are granted only, no, it doesn't say only, are granted upon a showing of good cause by the moving party, which may be found, which may be found where the need for the expedited discovery in consideration of the administration of justice outweighs the prejudice to the responding party. So there are standards for this early discovery. It's not just a, a blank check. Oh, you want discovery? Here you go. Go have fun. It's a balancing test. You need to show a need for the expedited discovery in considering the administration of justice. Now, one thing we know about strike three, what they're doing right now is they're filing these actions in Florida state court Florida State Court, they're filing what's known as Bill of Discovery. They're filing a Bill of Discovery in the Florida State Courts, and they're basically seeking your name and your address from the internet service provider, and that's is one way they're, they're trying to get your name and address. But what we have seen in many, in many if not all cases, um, it's certainly in many cases, they are not challenging when you file a motion to quash in Florida, they're not challenging it. They're doing what I call the cut and run. Oh, let's let's not let's not file here. We'll go file in the federal courts instead. That kind of thing. So this is what's going on. The, these may be raising, and I'm not suggesting they are, but I'm saying these may be raising questions of the administration of justice. Is it proper to? This is questions I'm asking. Is it proper to file in Florida to do the state court? not seek the name and address there and then come over into the Southern District of California and seek the name and address here. Obviously, the party, the Doe, has to go get an attorney in Florida and get an attorney here. So um, is that prejudice? These are questions we're asking Is uh, right now. We're in the middle of a heated battle on many fronts with strike three, okay? Uh, is this the prejudice to the opposing party? A district court's decision to grant discovery do to, to determine jurisdictional facts is a matter of discretion. Okay, that's why I said Northern District, you may get one ruling, Southern District of California, Eastern District of California, and Southern District of California. Those are your four districts, okay? Uh, but here it is. There are standards for this, and this is what needs to be focused on. There are standards to getting this motion for early subpoena granted it's not just a blank check there are standards that they need to be held to district courts in the ninth circuit apply a three-factor test three-factor test to see what to determine whether good cause exists to allow for expedited discovery to identify the doe defendant so let's take a look at these here we here we have them First, the plaintiff should identify the missing party with sufficient specificity such that the court can determine that the defendant is a real person or entity who could be sued in federal court. Okay. Second, the plaintiff should identify all previous steps taken to locate the elusive defendant to ensure that the plaintiff has made a good faith effort to identify and serve process on the defendant. Now, that's why I say... Um, 
they try to make these good faith efforts in Florida in these state court bill of discovery actions, but in many cases, if not all, we're not seeing them follow through on that when challenged with a motion to quash. So they have this opportunity to learn the name. They're not doing it now. They're coming now. They're coming here into uh, federal federal court. Okay. Um, third, the plaintiff should establish to the court's satisfaction that the plaintiff's suit against the defendant could withstand a motion to dismiss. Now, in Bit, BitTorrent file sharing cases, you got to read the Cobbler case. This is the critical case in the Ninth Circuit, the Cobbler case. And the Cobbler case says you can't just sue somebody because they have an internet account. And you say, well, there's, there's 50 infringing movies from this IP address. Well, that doesn't mean that the subscriber is the infringer. Do you follow me? That doesn't mean the subscriber to the internet account is also the infringer. Okay, it's just like you have a phone bill. And remember, you used to have phone bills with all the numbers on it. And just because somebody is the, uh, you know, your, your mom signs up for the phone bill, she has five kids and kids are making phone calls all day long. You don't know which one of those is, is the one making the, the phone call. Okay. Um, so they should be able to, they should be able to establish this. Does not say the defendant needs to establish. This says the plaintiff should establish to the court's satisfaction that the plaintiff's suit against the defendant could withstand a motion to dismiss. Now with Cobbler, we're asking the tough questions right now. We're asking the tough questions right now. Are these, are these early discovery motions good? Should they be given subpoenas with this, um, what I call this East Coast, West Coast deal going on to sue in Florida, then you sue in California? Um, can they show in California in the Ninth Circuit courts, which is going to be Washington, Oregon, Utah, Montana, Arizona, Nevada, California, are they able to show? It says right here, the plaintiff should establish to the court's satisfaction that they can withstand a motion to dismiss. Cobbler is one of them. Cobbler is one of the key cases. So that's what we're looking at right now. Um, this is cutting edge law, in my opinion. Um, so it's very exciting for me. And this decision from the judge shows that there are standards. And I think this is very important. Okay. Lastly, the plaintiff should file a request for discovery with the court, along with statements of reasons. The more another qualification they want the plaintiff to do this along with a statement of reasons justifying the specific discovery requested as well as an identification of a limited number of persons or entities on whom discovery process might be served and for which there is a reasonable likelihood that the discovery process will lead to identifying information about the defendant that would make service of process possible okay here we go. Plaintiff seeks to serve the Rule 45 subpoena. This is what we called in federal court. On WebPass, must be the uh, internet service provider in this case, before the Rule 26F conference. So here's the analysis. Here's the court's analysis in denying, denying Strike three's motion for early discovery. So watch, listen closely here. So the plaintiff may obtain the true name and address of the defendant. That's what they want. Plaintiff represents that it will only use this information to prosecute the claims made in its complaint. And without this information, plaintiff cannot serve defendant nor pursue this lawsuit and protect its copyrights. What's going on with my light there? <laughs> Sometimes these lights, they tell you. Anyway, I'll probably come back on in a second. We'll continue. Um, so, but re again, realize that they're pursuing this state court action, seeking the name and address, but apparently not pursuing that um, in many, many, if not all cases. In light of the certain allegations in the complaint, the court will first analyze the second factor. This is what the court's looking at, whether plaintiff has identified all steps it took to locate defendant to ensure the court that it has made a good faith effort to identify and serve process on defendant. The court finds plaintiff has not met its burden with respect to this factor. So defendant, defendant uh, plaintiff has not met their burden. That's what I'm saying, their burden. In the pending motion, plaintiff states that it has diligently attempted to locate defendant, 
by searching for a defendant's IP address using online search engines and various web search tools. Plaintiff further states it also has reviewed numerous sources of authority, such as legislative reports, agency websites, and information technology guides regarding whether it is possible to identify such a defendant by any other means by other means and has discussed the issue at length with computer investigators and cybersecurity consultants. Plaintiff concludes it cannot determine any other means of obtaining defendant identity other than through subpoenaing the information from defendant's ISP. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, they had the, they were there in the Florida court. The first step in many of these cases, not all, but many of these cases, we're now seeing these Florida actions. Plaintiff concludes it cannot determine any other means. Well, what about that? What about the Florida action? However, plaintiff makes no reference in its motion to the following allegation that is made in its complaint. Now, this is in the complaint. They're referring to what they did, but not in the motion for early discovery. In an effort to conceive, to conserve, I don't know how this conserves, maybe I see, conserves federal judicial resources, Strike 3 originally moved to discover defendant's identity using a state court procedure in Florida where Strike 3's detection servers are located. Defendant objected. St ob the defendant objected. Here we have it. Asserting that the action is more properly litigated in the federal court of his or her domicile because plaintiff is amenable to litigating the matter in either form, this suit was then initiated. Okay. Now, what's the court say? A fair reading of this allegation suggests that the defendant appeared in a prior action filed by plaintiff and prior action concerning the infringement alleged herein and identified the Southern District Court of California as his or her or its domicile. If defendant did make such an appearance, it seems to the court that plaintiff is aware of defendant's identity or at a minimum may have a, an available mechanism to determine defendant's identity at a minimum. They have an avail, may have an available mechanism to determine defendant's identity. As such, based on the record, the court cannot conclude that the need for expedited discovery in consideration of the administration of justice outweighs the prejudice to the responding party, that balancing test. So there you have it. Um, again, a uh, motion for early discovery was denied without prejudice, meaning they can come back and bring it again with other facts and whatnot. But there you have it, folks. So this is not a rubber stamp. Seeking early discovery is not a rubber stamp. Um, we are challenging these cases. This is, again, a lot of this stuff is our new novel legal issues that we're dealing with, with the internet, file sharing, all kinds of things. But that it, holding, I think, is important to other litigators are out there. I know I'm not the only one in the trenches fighting these cases, but here you have, if you need a consultation, if you're seeking legal counsel, find somebody that's educated, somebody that can, you know, we I put this stuff out here. I don't know of too many other attorneys that really go through the the painstaking process of bringing you now I enjoy it so don't, don't get me wrong but bringing you the, the cases the things that are going on the courts rulings from the courts okay different points of view that maybe you're you're reading on internet okay this is attorneysteve.com we offer free consultations if you have been sued in a federal court if you're dealing with a strike three legal issue give us a call you can find us on the web at attorney Steve. Dot com. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I know that's a mouthful, but it's a very important ruling that I think needs to be made public. Okay. It's a very newsworthy item. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. I got to get back to work. I got tons to do, but I just wanted to share that. Okay. Peace. Be safe now. Bye.